What's poppin' guys? What's good? Let's dive into Impact Wrestling for April the 6th, 2023. So, we kicked the show off with the Motion Machine Guns versus the Mighty Don't Kneel. And the Mostly Machine Guns, they win via the Crucifix. So that was cool there. So post-match, the Machine Guns run into the Bullet Club. And they want another title shot. So Chris Saban says they have a rematch. And they're going to up the ante and make it an Ultimate X match at Rebellion. And I'm just like, no... We don't need any more ladder matches. We can't do something different. For real. Like, I'm tired of ladder matches right now. I'm tired of them. Enough. Enough. Ladder matches are way too overdone. We saw two of them. Last weekend, we saw two of them. Ring of, Ring of Honor and in NXT. Enough. We don't need any more ladder matches right now. That's just me. Moving on. So Eddie Edwards, he's backstage with Kenny King. They're in, in the locker room talking. And so Eddie wants to make sure that Kenny King has his back against PCO tonight. And so... Kenny King's like, nah, I wish I could help you out, but I can't. I got other business business to take care of and to, uh, to attend to. Um, who cares? Like, it doesn't really matter. Like, I'm so over this Eddie Edwards PCO stuff. I, I really am. Moving on, so Tommy Dreamer, he finds Scott Demore and says that he's serious about having him on his team at Rebellion. He wants um, Scott to join his team. So Scott then uh, turns him down and says he, he's past his prime, which is true. And Scott Demore says, I'm pretty sure Tommy Dreamer has it all handled and we'll figure it out. Again, Scott Demore doesn't need to be on television. He just needs to run the show behind the scenes. Seriously. Next, Jonathan Gresham versus Mike Bailey, number one contenders match for the X Division Championship. Terry McGill uh, is on commentary. He's pretty good on commentary. Uh, I liked him. The way that he harassed uh, Tom Hannafin was funny. <laughs> I laughed my ass off in that shit. Well, some of it. So basically, it was a no contest. Jeremy Go got involved and took out both Mike Bailey and Jonathan Gresham. So post match, Trey attempts to to grab uh, his spray paint, but he retreats after um, he sees Mike Bailey and Jonathan Gresham want to kick his ass. So I guarantee this is going to lead to a triple threat. Which we all know it does. Later on in the show. The, 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 oh, my bad. The design. Oh, God. They're talking with Sammy Callahan. Diener, that is. So Diener says he's surprised that Sammy Callahan has, has made it this far. And so Sammy goes off on Callahan. I mean, my bad. <laughs> Not Sammy goes off on Callahan. What the hell? I'm so sorry. Sammy... Go, begins to go off on Diener, saying that, you know, he's done everything that he asked him to do, from shaving his head to helping him out to getting his ass kicked and everything. And he basically tells Diener that he's ready for step seven. And so Diener says, what you're going to have to do is learn to eliminate all other authority in his life. I'm just like, what the hell? What the hell is this shit? 
Like, this is so insane. Next. Mike Bailey and Jonathan Gresham, they were arguing with Santino. When Trey McGill walks up, Trey McGill started talking stuff. So, Trey McGill said, you know, he's fine taking them uh, both on. So, Santino makes it a triple threat match. But it's going to be a elimination match at Rebellion. And I'm just like, no, but who really cares? It, it doesn't really matter. Trey is going to win for the most part. Next, we get the debut of Jody Threat. So she defeated Ty Rising. Okay. And I did some research. She spent some time in AEW. Not on Rampage or Dynamite. She spent time in Dark and Dark Elevation. Whoop dee damn do. What a waste of talent. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Impact should have given her at least, or given us at least two or three vignettes explaining who Jody Threat is. That's what they should always do. Instead of just bringing in talent that we know nothing about. You can't just have just one vignette. We need at least three to four vignettes. Minimum. Bare minimum. Like seriously, come on. This is so stupid. Oh, I forgot to mention that um, when Jonathan Gresham and Mike Bailey were arguing, Dirty Dango said some weird stuff. Talking about, I can help you guys out with threesomes. And I'm like, what the hell? And both of them looked at him like, man, what the fuck did you just say? <laughs> it was kind of funny. I, I was critted, I mean, I was weirded out by it. It was very weird and bizarre. Moving on. So, Dirty Dango and Paramedics, they're backstage to check on Santino. Scott Demore walks up. So, Dango says it was the design who attacked and took out Santino. Dirty Dango says that he's in charge now. So, Scott Demore says, yeah, whatever, he's not buying it. Um, Dirty Dango wants to face the, the design. So Santino, he chimes in and says this is an opportunity to educate his son, Marco, who's going to be at Rebellion. Santino says he's been away from the ring for nine years. And he's got 75% left in the in the tank. Or something like that. Something of those sorts. Um, so he says that he has to remind people who he is. So Scott Demore booked... A six-man tag, The Design versus Santino, Dirty Dango, and Joe Hendry. Okay, it's fine, I guess. Who really cares, though? Not important. Um, My girl Tasha Steeles, she's out next. She's, she's being, being interviewed by Gia Miller. So, Tasha says she went home and had to find herself. So, Giselle Shaw and company, they walk up and they interrupt. So, Steele says she has no problem kicking Giselle's ass next week. And she's glad that she dropped Savannah. So, Giselle thinks that Tasha has bitten off more than she can chew. And she also mentioned um, about Tasha not having any... Flavor. So that begs the question are they going to bring back or temporarily reunite Fire and Flavor? That being Kiara Hogan and Tasha Steeles. I think so because Tasha, I mean, not Tasha Steeles, but Kiara Hogan hasn't done really much of anything being with AEW. She's been on Dynamite a handful of times and she's been on Rampage a handful of times. I don't know if she's in Ring of Honor or not. I don't. I just want to say that she's just been used on Dark and Dark Elevation. 
So that would make sense to bring back Kiara Hogan. That's what I would do, and hopefully that's what Impact does. Uh, next, Bully Ray in the Good Hands versus Tommy Dreamer, Yuya Uemura, and Darren McCarty. So Darren McCarty gets the win here via the stunner. Post match, Kenny King. He joins the fray and starts to beat down on Tommy Dreamer and Darren and Yuya. And then uh, Masha Slamovich, she, she enters uh, the fray as well. But Frankie Kazarian and Killer Kelly, they come in and, and neutralize uh, the plan. So basically, um, the teams are basically set. So it's going to be Tommy Dreamer, Yuya Uemura, Darren... And Frankie Kazarian, Frankie Kazarian, no, my bad. It's gonna be Frankie Kazarian, Yu Yu Amora, Tommy Dreamer, Darren McCarty, and um, Killer Kelly versus Masha Slamovich, Bully Ray in the Good Hands, and Kenny King. Okay, who cares though? It's not important. Doesn't really matter. It's basically going to be a, a hardcore war. Like, ugh. Boring. So, we get a extensive look at Josh Alexander's historic title reign. And also, Impact Wrestling congratulated Jordan Grace for winning her bodybuilding co- competition. That's cool. I wouldn't be surprised if Jordan Grace has been in talks with Charlotte Flair, which she probably is. I wouldn't even be shocked. I'm not going to hold you up. Probably so. Uh, Why not? I mean, they're both bodybuilders and they're both wrestlers. So that would make sense. Um, Moving on, we get a promo by Deanna Perrazzo. So Deanna says the last 18 months been a roller coaster. She said that she went from world champ to tag champ with her best friend to nothing. She also said she built the age of the virtu- virtuosa upon arrival. She wasn't prepared for a title match at Rebellion, but she's ready now. Deanna says that Jordan Grace has never beaten her while she's never beaten Mickey. Deanna says she'll become a three-time champion. Not going to happen. I do think that Deanna Peraza is going to be the one to eat the pin. And then we'll probably get a one-on-one match against I mean, uh, Mickey James and Jordan Grace at Slammiversary. It would make sense to kind of build to that. And have a decisive winner that way, I think that would make the most sense. Because Deanna Perrazzo, to me, seems on her way out. It, it just seems that way. Um, and I know this is not going to be popular to say, but I do think that her going back to WWE would actually be smart. It would actually make the most sense. She's done everything that she can do in Impact. There's nothing more else she can do. There's nothing more else. When when she came into the company, they immediately gave her the rocket and they launched her into space. Like, if I was Diana Perrazzo, even though there's a lot of shit going on with, with, with the WWE and, and then merging with Endeavor and UFC... I would take my chances and and actually go back there. Seriously, that's exactly what I would do. Next, Eddie Edwards versus PCO. Eddie Edwards wins via the Boston Knee Party. His wife, Alicia, she gets involved. She hits PCO with a kendo stick. Um, Post-match, PCO chases Eddie and his wife out of the arena. So PCO is hunting for Eddie and Alicia backstage and screaming, Eddie. And um, Eddie 
and Alicia, they dip out. They hop into the to their car and dip out. So, who really cares? It's not important. I'm ready for this feud to end. I'd say the best way to end it is either a last man standing or an I quit match. That's what kind of needs to happen. It kind of calls for that stipulation. We don't need a, a Monsters Ball match. We've seen way too many of those. And Impact goes to, uh, goes to that wheelhouse far too much to kind of end feuds. So the closing segment. So Scott Demore, he's in the ring with Kushida and Steve Macklin. So Scott says that every ending leads to a new beginning. And a new world champ will be crowned at Rebellion. So Scott then brings out Josh Alexander. He's accompanied by his wife and son. So Josh thanks the crowd and reflects on the opportunities he's had to reach the pinnacle of impact. So Josh remembers receiving his first impact contract and now he becomes the longest reigning impact champion of all time. And for some odd reason, he gets the best world champ champ, which doesn't make any sense because he's not because there are, are greats such as Kurt Angle, AJ Styles, Sting, Jeff Hardy, and others. But now Josh is torn his tricep and he's going to be out indefinitely. He gets to go back to being a fan, just like his son. Josh says he'll be watching at Rebellion to see who comes who becomes the new champion. Josh says Kushida is one of the most ruthless wrestlers in the world. And he can make Macklin tap out, that being Kushida. So then Josh turns to Steve Macklin and says he's earned his shot, but he wishes that it was against him. So Josh warns both of them that if they hold it long enough, he'll be coming back to reclaim what's his. So Josh's son grabs the title before he's able to hand it over. And then Josh hands it to Scott. So Mackin gets on the mic and says that now that the formality and bullshit is done, he wants Scott to hand him the title. And I love this. So Macklin says that this is Josh's way out. So Scott Demore gets angry and says that he can't believe that Macklin would try and go, go Josh into a fight fresh off of his surgery. Scott says Macklin should have answered an open challenge a while back and not Mike Bailey um, or step to the champ man, the man, but instead he's a coward, he's a coward son of a bitch. Scott says he's supposed to be unbiased, but he can't right now. Scott reminds everyone that Kashida made Macklin tap out a, a couple weeks back. Um, actually, no, that was last week. <laughs> so Macklin says he won't put his pride on the line in a match that doesn't mean anything, which is 1,000% correct. Like, why would you? So Kashida steps to Macklin. Macklin declares himself the next champ. Macklin tells Kushida to enjoy the spotlight while it lasts. So Kushida and Macklin, let's start the brawl. Kushida locks in the hover lock. Kushida goes out to the outside to do a dive. And then Kushida raises the title in the air. And he and Macklin have a stare down and a couple of choice words. And that's how we go off the air. So it was an okay show for the most part. Now... I do like this. I do think that what they're going to do is they're going to have Macklin win, which is going to be the right call. Macklin needs to defeat Kushida clean. It's okay for Macklin to be a heel, but Macklin needs to defeat needs to defeat Kushida with ease. Hopefully, Josh Alexander can come back by Bound for Glory. And you have Josh Alexander versus Steve Macklin. You have Macklin go over there. Then you have Josh turn heel. That allows him to 
uh, add more depth to his character. And that actually gives him a character. Because it's been a while since he's been healed. He hasn't been healed since, I want to say, 2020. So basically three years. So it's time for him to go back to being a heel. I think that would be tremendous. That's what I would do. Also, if I'm Impact, with what's going on with WWE right now, when they do releases, and if Drew McIntyre decides not to uh, to sign to resign with WWE, they need to be trying to get in touch with Drew McIntyre, Karrion Cross, possibly Bray Wyatt, and possibly Braun Strowman, because Impact needs some fresh blood. Impact has got to have some fresh blood. They've got to. They need it. They need some fresh guys in that main event scene. Guys that can draw them money. Guys that can put them on the map. And if they had a main event scene of Drew McIntyre, Karrion Cross, Moose, Steve Macklin, Josh Alexander... Braun Strowman, and possibly Bray Wyatt, that would be a great main event scene. A great main event scene. Because if if Bray Wyatt gets released, he's not going to AEW, and I don't see Bray leaving the wrestling industry and going into Hollywood because he has a rich family history with the business. So I don't see him doing that. I think that with Bray's character and the type of shit that he likes to do, Impact would be, would be the best destination to do it. And Impact would do shit like that. They would. Impact would love stuff like that. He doesn't have to be with, with Decay or anything like that. But you can build that show around Bray and Braun, um, Bray and Braun Strowman and, and guys like that. Seriously, Impact needs fresh blood. They have to have fresh blood. They have to. They have to. And um, that mid-card scene needs to get a lot better too. So if WWE, let's say they decide, uh, they decide to release some guys uh, on the NXT side of things. Like, like let's say they get rid of like uh, Ilya Dragunov, Tyler Bate, Roderick Strong... You know, bring those guys in. Um, that's what I would do. For the tag division, try to bring in guys like AOP. If the Viking Raiders get released, bring those guys in. You know, start start looking for this stuff. because it, It's going to happen. There's a reason as to why I'm mentioning this. I want Impact to do better. And I do think that when the WWE starts to do these releases... Impact needs to start picking out guys and girls that they know that they can they can get and start locking these people into three-year deals. Lock them down in three-year deals. Don't lock them down in like a year deal. Lock them down in three-year deals. That's what I would do. But overall, the show was solid. It was decent. Rebellion is shaping up to be okay. For the most part, what did you guys think? Thank you guys for watching. Please hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe for my videos. I'll catch you guys later. Peace.